can grab the code right now. We'll just get clone. Uh, Preston's, uh, I'll get uh, Preston slash ruby dash dq dash examples dot git. I mean, grab it. Uh, if you want to follow along, you just kind of click through the code a little bit. That's cool. Um, you do need, if you want to run all the examples, you do need a lot of dependencies, and it's not just Ruby either. Um, one specifically for all the Mac people using NVIDIA chipsets here, you actually need the NVIDIA development driver toolkit, as well as Ruby 1.9 and JRuby 1.6. So uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it now, so we just relax uh, before you get started, a little, uh, a little simpler. Um, so before I really kind of dive into it, I want to just challenge, uh, challenge everybody. Now, when it comes to concurrency, when it comes to uh, things like multi-threading and scaling and Ruby, I, I swim vehemently against the current. Um, and there's a lot of massive pros on, you know, you know prevented uh, architectures and shared nothing architectures. And it, I'm not dismissing that, but personally, I think that we are essentially amputating our computers by refusing to deal with threads at a level. Um, granted, there are a lot of complications that can come up. You do have to deal with sharing memory and things like that. However, we also have a great tool that helps us deal with um, thread scheduling and sharing things. It's called the operating system. <laughs> um, so the operating system provides a lot of tools for us, and yeah, we, there are some things we have to learn about uh, concurrency. And I know that there's going to be a, I think some other speakers morning as well that are saying completely the opposite. So, <laughs> um, but I think that's good. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about um, a synthetic example, but I, I think it's good to have you know, at least some sort of use case. And so uh, let's find the area of a tree ring. Let's see here a circle. Do you have a radius? Fire square. Okay, good. Everybody has a radius square. Sure. So um, <clears throat> now, what if we have a really old tree and we're developing some sort of tree ring simulator or something like that, and we want to find the area of every tree ring simultaneously um, for every tree ring? Well, okay, so. <clears throat> Let's just uh, justify ourselves if we're going to do this correctly. The area of the light blue circle inside, that's pi r squared, that's the entire area. But if you wanted to find the area of just a single ring, say this dark area, uh, the dark blue ring, you could take pi r squared, give it radius 5, and then subtract the area of the previous ring, right? And then we do that for every ring. So we could do that recursively, we do, we do a, a, a separate function. Um, it's essentially the same operation, just with a different radius every time. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. And we're interested in finding the area of a very, very old tree as fast as possible. Um, so our first attempt, which is very simple, uh, we have our basic formula. Right there, we find a simple function that given the radius, and we return the area of just that single ring. This is not recursive, it's just a floating point arithmetic, and it returns a raw float value, no big deal. Now, to for a given number of rings, doesn't really matter, just put that in a, a, a simple for loop and print it to the console and we're done. So that's no big deal. We don't need any special libraries. You can get the Ruby by itself. <clears throat> um, but you know we have a lot of additional system resources, and maybe we're trying to you have know, this whole database of trees, and no one is just going to serialize everything. So we might make a second working attempt. This is multi-threading. Um, and so this one is essentially the same thing. We have this depth ring area at the top of the radius, that function remains unchanged, but instead of a, the, the simple for loop, we just have a few more lines. One is to uh, create a thread, this thread.new right there, and then we essentially just, for say four threads, we chunk the amount of work. So if you have four threads, we calculate 25% of the number of rings per thread, and we let the operating system figure out what CPU to run all these threads on. So in theory, we have some big performance speed up. And then, of course, we wanted to make an even uh, lower level attempt. You can make a third and a fourth uh, attempt using uh, raw C, which is almost as fast as, as you can get and without getting insane or any uh, assembler or machine code manually. Um, and this is all in, in the project. I'm not really going to go through this in detail, but to, <clears throat> suffice to say, it's the same thing, just in C, so it's a little bit ugly. Um, there's, this particular um, file is a single C file. It provides both a single-threaded implementation as well as a multi-threaded implementation using P threads, which are kind of you know, the POSIX standard. So um, for all the Mac users, all the Linux users here, um, which encompasses all computing, right? Um, that, so you're good. <laughs> uh, Windows, I, I'm not the person to ask about that. But uh, this gets a little more complicated. Than you you start to see that you know, the entirety of the code, I mean, you can't fit on a slide, so there's clearly some, uh, some more things to consider. 
But at the end of the day, when we're, we're talking about a given Ruby gem, and just pretty much anything you download, um, you know, gem install, Google it's going to usually fall within one of these first four categories. One is just pure Ruby, great, hopefully no major dependencies, and installs fine. Secondly, pure Ruby, multi thread, so thread safe. Um, not a lot of gems, unfortunately, are thread safe, and actually, most of the time, when you are looking for um, looking at a given gem, it won't even say it's thread safe. Please don't do that. Please specify if your gem is thread safe or not. Um, third, we have a lot of native or uh, Ruby gems with native components, uh, database drivers. That's, you know, for example, database access. We want that to be super, super fast. Um, so a lot of the times, uh, MySQL or SQLite or the Postgres drivers will have some sort of either single threaded or multi threaded implementation, three or four right there, um, which will generally give us a bit of speed up. And then five, which isn't really code, but this. General, uh, general paradigm of divide and conquer. So, okay, we've optimized our, our library or function as much as possible, but it's still not fast enough. Okay, well, let's just scale out horizontally, use clouds, use supercomputers, use something, um, and just get it to churn out more throughput. So, let's go to some code now. Hopefully, oh, that's not going to be enough. So, I want, I want to run a few of these examples. Um, now, the first, those first two are going to be in this first example. This is using the Ruby 192 uh, Ruby interpreter. So just quick show of hands, who thinks that the first implementation, which is the single threaded one, um, is going to be the fastest? <laughs> Nobody. Okay. So who thinks the second implementation, the multi threaded, runs, uh, on the exact same runtime is going to be faster? Also, no way. <laughs> Hmm, okay. So I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so, but it's, it's a question. So let, let's just, you know, forget hospitalization. Let's just actually run this. Um, make sure we use the right Ruby. 192. Are we up? Yeah. Good job, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll run this. Sorry, it's cheating a little bit. So it's running a serial calculation on the CPU with about 16 million tree rings. It's a pretty old tree. It took about 7 seconds, or 7.6 seconds, running the multi thread calculation using four CP threads. My system has four logical CP cores. And it took 7.7 .7 seconds. Um, it took slightly longer to run a multi thread implementation on the V1.9 than it did a single thread implementation. Let's skip over one show. Here. We're going to run the exact same script in JRuby. Single threaded using the CPU. <coughs> About 8.5 seconds. Parallel calculation using four CPU threads, five seconds. Um, so this does vary slightly, you know, depending on what else is going on in your system. Uh, but the multi-threaded implementation on JRuby took significantly less time than the Ruby, <coughs> the Ruby 1.9 version, despite the fact that both support native operating system threads. <coughs> Okay, so let's take a little, a little bit of why that is. So first of all, um, you think about your CPU and just the you know, kind of way we all write um, applications on a regular basis. I'm guessing at least nine out of ten people here, if not like ninety-eight or higher percent of you, have a system with multiple CPU cores on a single die. Um, that's just standard these days, and especially for development machines, it's unlikely unless you just only want to spend like two hundred dollars in price electronics on a laptop that you probably have multiple cores. Ruby 1.9, despite being able to run multiple threads natively, because of the global interpreter lock, can only use one of these cores at a time. Um, I don't want to get into the arguments on why that's a good thing or a bad thing, but suffice to say that for a given Ruby process, you're only going to want to use one CPU core. Where JRuby is capable of using all the cores simultaneously because it doesn't have that same limitation. Of course, there are some potential other implications and issues that go along with that. But if we go back to our code here, now look at the Ruby one point nine example. And this time I'm going to open Activity Monitor and just well, this is very small, but just keeping a keeping a look at the top the top item. I have 100 percent CPU usage, and that's, that sounds good, but it's actually bad because it should be 400 percent because I have four CPUs. Even on running a multi-threaded version. We skip over here, 
Is the JRAM implementation just to prove to ourselves it's doing what we think it's doing? Or CPU, when we're running the parallel one, to see if there's a second error? To 300% or 256%, 358%. So we actually, and you can see it down here in the graph, we we're getting a big CPU spike. So really out of the box, um, we're getting some big performance information here. Okay, so um, the common uh, number of CPU is using some of the, some of the arguments we can make for not supporting um, running threads in multiple cores. One is the block performance. Um, it's kind of nice to have just shared nothing, single thread architectures. Because you know, we don't even have to worry about locks much of the time. Um, we don't have any insane numbers of threads proposed. For example, if we want to figure out how to spin off 16 million threads on our operating system, it would, uh, it'll laugh at you and say, "No, I'm not going to do that. That's just way too many, uh, way too many threads for a single process. It'll probably topple over." I mean, swapping, testing multi-thread applications is extremely problematic. Um, everything that you know about TDD, EDD starts to break down when you're testing applications that execute in a non-deterministic manner. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any frameworks in Ruby that I know of um, that deal with that problem to speak of, or at least today. So what we really want to do, and here's the key question, can we just execute every instruction, 16 million of them, rather than a loop, you know, thread or single thread or whatever, but can we operate every single one at the same time just with a different data point? So instead of running our algorithm 16 million times, can we run it once? Um, on a CPU, the answer is no. You can't. Um, that's just not what it was designed for. The paradigm is called multiple instruction, multiple data, or MIMD. Um, and so that's not really plausible in the way we, that we commonly think of our computers, unless you use a GPU. Um, our GPU looks s very similar to the CPU in that um, a physical die, um, usually on the video card of your computer, has multiple uh, cores that are called cores, though, on um, NVIDIA terms, it's streaming multiprocessors. However, unlike a CPU, um, where a given core can only run one thread at a time, or max maybe two, um, a given streaming multiprocessor can run entire blocks of threads at the same time, um, which is very powerful in this particular case. Um, and not only that, not multiple threads, but hundreds of threads, potentially thousands of threads concurrently. This is all using hardware that most of you actually have in your computers right now, but probably are writing, writing for it. Um, so when you're using a GPU for a calculation like this, the answer can be yes. Um, now, for 16 million times, that's a bit of a stretch, but you know, if you wanted to do this maybe a thousand times in parallel, there are some pieces of hardware that can do this out of the box. Um, I'll show some statistics as well and kind of how you can figure out how many threads that you were GPU can process. Um, how am I doing on time? All right, we're just going to I'm going to skip the, the history stuff. Um, you can grab the slides if you're interested in that. These are just some examples. I mean, if you've never ripped open a machine before, I'm sure you guys have. But uh, this particular one is interesting. It looks like a video card. This is an NVIDIA Tesla. Um, I'm not sure exactly what model it is. It kind of looks like a C1060, but uh, this one has a video port. Um, it's, most of them, these specialized GPU cards, like these extremely high performance GPUs, um, they have, they, you access them with the same drivers that you can use on your local machine. However, some of these don't have video ports, so it's like a video card without the video output, too. It's kind of weird. Um, so that's an NVIDIA Tesla. You can load these into servers um, multiple at a time, so you can many of these uh, streaming multi processors your system. Here's a, here's a chip from ATI and their stream architecture, which is similar. Uh, here's a standard video card. Common off the, excuse me, uh, common off the shelf uh, chips that ship with every Mac here, probably if you have an NVIDIA chip in a Mac manufacturer in the last few years and you're running Snow Leopard, um, you actually have OpenCL 1.0 compatibility of Mac Snow Leopard chips with the driver. Um, you don't have the, the NVIDIA SDK tools and everything, so you need to download uh, all those tools, but you have the hardware and support for it. <coughs> uh, so, okay, GPU pr pros, uh, the SIMD architecture, the ability to execute a single instruction and multiple data points simultaneously, you can run potentially thousands of threads concurrently. Sometimes synchronization issues are designed out, sometimes not. It depends exactly on the type of calculation you're trying to do. Um, <coughs> Much of the time, we have more floating point operations than the host CPU, despite a different clock rate. Um, and again, that same point at the bottom. Okay. So I'm going to jump to some Java code here. 
very quickly, um, don't sweat the Java code, um, but I do want to show what happens or the information that comes out of the, the driver on the system. And I, I do realize this is too small. Okay, so I have two compute devices on my machine, one of which is the GPU up here on top, the other is my CPU on the bottom. If we look at the CPU to start with, um, it's a Core 7, uh, i7 CPU, OpenCL 1.0. Um, how many compute units or how many cores I have on my machine? That's four. And I'll skip the dimensions. Uh, clock frequency 2.8 gigahertz. It's a 64 bit architecture. I can alloc. Uh, well, I'm not exactly clear what that means, but I can alloc somewhere uh, at least 1.5 gigabytes at a time. Uh, and then there's another interesting one, the default work group size, so the, the number of threads that each core can execute at a time is one. And that's per compute unit. Whereas the GPU up here, and this is a standard MacBook Pro, um, I, GeForce GT. Did the mic go off? GeForce GT uh, 330M, NVIDIA, OpenCL 1.0 again. It's a GPU type, not a CPU type. The number of compute units is six. The number of threads per, per thread block um, or that can execute one of those concurrently is 512. Now granted, the clock frequency, the clock rate, the, the rate which uh, raw instructions execute on the chip is significantly slower. It's only 1.1 gigahertz, and it's a 32-bit chip also. So even though my CPU is 64-bit, the GPU is 32-bit. And uh, the, I believe pretty much, if not all, the popular uh, personal supercomputer GPU cards that you can grab these um, still today are 32-bit. Um, it sometimes is a problem, sometimes it's not, but you just have to be cognizant of that fact. The alloc size, or how much memory you can consume, um, at, one, at a given point in time is significantly lower. And on my video card in my machine right now, I can only do 128 megabyte on the ALEC. In theory, for some reason, it, it doesn't seem to allow you to go up to that. I, I think I can do 64, but it's like a side issue or something, I'm not sure. So uh, those are the two compute devices that I have in my machine. I do this one-handed. And then, uh, fortunately, I didn't want to uh, log a giant desktop machine on, a, on an airplane with me, so I didn't, I didn't bring in a Tesla C1060 with me in, in a machine, but this is the output captured from that. Uh, max compute units, it's highlighted in uh, bold, so it's small, but it's uh, 30. The number of threads per group size is 512, that's thousands of threads. Uh, the clock rate is a little bit higher, 1 point, approximately 1.3 gigahertz, still a 32-bit architecture, and the alloc size is about, what is it, a gig, a gig-ish at a time. So the difference in throughput between what you have in your laptop and what you can get in all these commercial cards for you know, five hundred or thousand dollars would be huge. And uh, I wish I could have all those here with me today. Okay, so let's, let's, I want to get to some code. Um, how do we actually start approaching this? So how do we use this interesting chip that we all have on our machines? Um, so what you probably want to do to get started is rather than, uh, well, you're going to need some of the, the native SDKs, so if you have an NVIDIA machine, you're going to need the uh, NVIDIA toolkit, but you're probably going to want to write to the, an abstraction layer on top of that rather than writing to the NVIDIA SDK directly um, or writing to the ATI uh, SDKs directly as well. Um, and the way to do that is an OpenCL. OpenCL stands for Open Computing Language. It's an abstraction on top of some sort of processing compute unit. Um, uh, uh, OpenCL device, uh, device being the, the, the term, is it can be either a GPU or a CPU as long as it supports um, the interface, you know, as long as the interface can be implemented on top of it. You can treat both of those as compute units. And that's why in my, my, my simple job at the query my system, I was actually doing an OpenCL query for compute devices and return two, the CPU and the GPU. You can have multiple GPUs per system, you can have multiple CPUs per system as well. Before we jump directly to the code, there's three terms that you should be aware of in OpenCL. Um, the first one is kernel. Now, in OpenCL, a 
kernel is the code that runs on the compute unit. It's just a function that would run on the GPU. This has nothing to do with your operating system kernel. Um, it's a very poorly chosen word. I wish they would have put, uh, chosen something else. But uh, when, I'm, when I'm saying kernel, I'm really just referring to functions that I'm uh, compiling and then running on the GPU directly. A device, something that computes, such as a GPU chip, um, not all systems are going to support OpenCL for the CPU. So if you do a device, an OpenCL device query on your machine, you may see a GPU, you might see a CPU, you might see nothing, you might see everything. Um, it's hard to say exactly. And then OpenCL, uh, not currently uh, on our machines, but in the future, it is spec'd out to support these network, these, these clusters of devices. And so, uh, while today we're really fairly limited um, in terms of what OpenCL supports in, in terms of distributing to other nodes on the network, uh, in the future, uh, we have, we're going to be able to, apparently, <laughs> uh, have devices that aren't necessarily mobile. So th that should allow us to more easily distribute some of these uh, large comp uh, computational jobs. And then there are, there are device-specific terms, and sometimes it gets a little confusing when you're reading um, literature because ATI and NVIDIA use slightly different terms, and then OpenCL uses slightly different terms as well, so there are, uh, <coughs> there are some uh, con confusing points. Once in a while. All right, so let's let's dive into some code. And there, we, we have these nine cases. Um, we've already been through four of them. The one and two, which were Ruby 1.9, single-threaded, multi-threaded, and oddly enough, single-threaded is faster for some reason. Um, we haven't done an OpenCL implementation. Um, we did JRuby single-threaded, which is four, and we also did five. Um, can we do JRuby with OpenCL? Uh, the answer right now is no-ish. Because under JRuby, you can't use a lot of uh, native extensions. It'll complain about stuff. I'm not exactly sure why you can't do that. Um, with JRuby, you could load a Java library to uh, connect to OpenCL directly. But if you try to load a Ruby library to do it, it's probably not going to work. I tried it. I couldn't get it to work with a Ruby library. Um, however, I can't get it to work with a Java library. So let's address number three, and then we talked uh, a little bit about our C implementation. We haven't actually run it yet. Uh, this is what you don't want to do. And this is a Java implementation. Actually, this isn't even the code that executes an algorithm. This is just the setup work for running, um, <laughs> for, for setting up a kernel to execute in a Java app using the Jocl library, uh, J-O-C-L. If, if you're familiar with Java, it might kind of strike you as odd if you can't read it. Um, one, there's pointers everywhere. Uh, that's kind of strange. Um, we're, we're malloking things, we're setting kernel args, we're enqueuing ND range kernel, whatever that means. We're enqueuing read buffers, we're releasing memory, we're creating command queues. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's horribly ugly. Um, so this, this is the, the JOCL binding in, in Java. Um, to access uh, the OpenCL implementation on your operating system. But obviously there's a learning curve for this. There isn't really a pretty uh, library, which is just kind of a, you know, the Ruby way, <laughs> where you don't have to get into the, to the details. Um, but fortunately, we do have a few options. Um, and I'll talk about the negatives as well. But I want to talk about the pretty way first. So if you have the code, um, you can bust that out in whatever tool you have that's too small. Okay. So <clears throat> the first one we'll look at is the uh, tree rings underscore yards in the bin directory. And I'm going to uncomment a method which is going to run a GPU implementation. The actual code for that, and this, this isn't on Ruby Gems or anything, by the way. It's a, a, I just did it for, for this presentation. There's going to be some issues to try to pull the gem out of it. Um, anyway. Okay, so the GPU implementation is surprisingly simple um, it's relative to the, the Java version because we have this nice little require Barracuda. Barracuda is a binding library for, uh, for the NVIDIA CUDA drivers and OpenCL. Create a new program that's going to run on the GPU. We define a C function, so it's just, I mean, if you've done native drivers before, and I know we have a talk later this morning about writing native C code. It looks just like a C function. There are some extensions to it. For example, we have this kernel declaration here. 
uh, which defines to the, when it's compiled, that this is actually going to run on an open CL device. It's not just a function for, this, for the CPU directly. Uh, there's a few other special flags, and it, when we're writing kernels, there are also some special API calls we can make. This particular one here, get global ID, is the OpenCL function to get your unique thread ID for the job. And so if you were running this 512 times, this would return, or it would execute simultaneously across all threads, but it would return a different value, it would return a unique value for each of those threads. We have the same implementation here, just in C instead. And then we have an output buffer um, which is actually going to need to be transferred back to CPU memory. Now, the, the GPU and the CPU operate in different memory spaces. They're two completely physically different processors connected together with a bus. And so when we think of computing normally and writing um, high-performance algorithms like this, most of the time we're just going to make implicitly in Ruby, but we're going to allocate some amount of system RAM, and we're going to run all the code on a CPU, the GPU has its own memory space. It has its own chip-wide global space where uh, data can be accessed and written to. There are also some more specific areas of memory since um, we have some, some powerful thread threading concepts. Each thread block of threads has its own global memory space that it, that it can write to as well. So you have uh, a few more options, but it's complicated, right? Because now we have separate memory areas, and now it's not just system RAM. Now we have GPU memory. Um, but all in all, um, when, this, <clears throat> when this kernel runs, the, the function output is put into this output buffer, and the Barracuda library specifically will automatically take care of copying that data from the GPU RAM to system memory and then giving you a nice array <laughs> in Ruby. So it's really super simple. Um, the entirety of the GPU implementation is this, and that's it. So, five minutes, all right. So we have a receive function, and then we have I like this. So um, since I'm a little short on time, I'm going to count that out. And I also have this native C implementation as well. Unfortunately, you can't. You're not, if you want to try it, you're not going to be able to run it um, without the NVIDIA tools installed because it, NVIDIA has a specific compiler. <coughs> Alright, let's run the Ruby 1.9 version one more time. Now granted, this is a synthetic example, right? I mean, I stacked the deck, so <laughs> I, I know what's going to happen on my specific machine. Um, but the point I'll make is that e despite the fact that this is just a common off-the-shelf laptop, um, the performance speed up for an algorithm like this can be some fairly dramatic. Um, and especially for a chip that I'm not even, you know, we don't even use. On a regular basis, there's a lot of algorithms we can put on it. Now, the C implementation, and uh, this is also an interesting example. I'm going to compile this and run it uh, right after the other. Hit enter. Whoops. Just kidding. Interpreter out of the box 
is a bit on the slender side. I don't think this is a big debating point. Um, so um, all in all, I just want to pose the question, you know, perhaps there's some additional um, tools in front of us that we're going to use. Um, in fact, do I have time for a few questions? I got a question. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned that there's a lot of people that are going to be using Um, the, the question is why is the Ruby GPU version slower than the C implementation? Right. Um, so <clears throat> there, there are some operations, and I didn't have time to, go to get to these slides, but there are some operations that happen that are not free. For example, when you have to copy large amounts of memory back, and I think it was probably at least 60 days of RAM of, of, of data, that, the, of result data that has to be copied back from the GPU to host memory. That has to go across a copper wire, and that's not a free operation. So if you have output that is you know, four bytes, that's going to be like a split. But if you're copying gigabytes and gigabytes of information back and forth across that, that the copper wire, it's going to start slowing down. Uh, the question is, if you're going to really scale this out, build a massive hardware farm, is there a, a particular car that gives you a lot of bang for the buck? Um, the, I, I'm familiar mostly with NVIDIA because I have um, I have a, a C1060 card to play with. I'm not very familiar with ATI's stream. Um, in general, I, I've been happy with the NVIDIA cards. They are very, very fast. Um, it's it's kind of cool too because if you have a, a Mac or another system where you can run OpenCL, you can prototype everything locally and then um, just push it to the server farm and it executes just so much faster on that. So I would check out the NVIDIA Tesla series specifically as a starting point. <coughs> Maybe more. Wow. Have you uh, played at all with Amazon's uh, GPU? And is that a decent place to learn? Um, the question is, um, have, have I played with Amazon's GPU? So uh, I think it was, it was like a few months ago or late last year. Amazon has they have an, an images now where they actually have GPU hardware. And that you can access via the image. Um, I haven't heard a lot of hype about people, uh, developers actually using it. Um, the direct answer is no, I haven't played with it, um, mainly because the pricing is not free. And <laughs> you know, if, if we're talking about like, leaving these systems up for a certain amount of time, um, I'm not sure I want to you know, spend you know, 200. I, I don't remember exactly how much it is, but it's not the, the micro image, <laughs> for sure. The question is, um, you know, since we probably don't care about tree rings, um, what do you actually use this for? Um, personally, uh, this this came out of a, a, a research paper um, that uh, submitted uh, elsewhere, um, and it was uh, modified to, to, to do Ruby because I'm personally very interested in GPU computing. Um, in terms of web apps, um, since I think it's probably a lot of Rails developers, so this probably is not something you'd be directly interested in. Really, it's any time you have some sort of mathematical calculation that you're doing in parallel with just different data points. That's when it's extremely valuable because the CPU is still your friend. Um, however, it just wasn't designed to literally run the same instructions simultaneously, even if it's multi-threaded and synchronized blocks or whatever. It's not literally um, simultaneous on the physical. So um, the, the appropriate use case for something like this is some sort of, usually some sort of small kernel, some sort of small function, usually some sort of simple math algorithm that you can run in mass and then return a simple set of data. Well, I was getting to, in practice, what, what are the examples of um, In practice, um, one of the other examples that, that we did um, in, in Java space was complete state enumeration. And so given a, a, a node and edge network, um, where you have, say, 30 nodes, um, compute the probability of having any given state of all the nodes uh, in, in the system. It, it turns out to be computationally difficult because it's two to the 30th states that you have to do. That is a great example of when to use GPUs because you can execute thousands of these probability calculations um, simultaneously using GPU. Thank you. Thank you.